I would bid you turn with me in your scriptures to 1 Peter chapter 1. 1 Peter chapter 1, we will read verses 1 through 9. 1 Peter chapter 1. Let's give atten- attention as we, uh, as we read the holy, inspired, inerrant word of God. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to those who reside as aliens scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, who are chosen according to the foreknowledge of God the Father by the sanctifying work of the Spirit, to obey Jesus Christ and be sprinkled with his blood, may grace and peace be yours in the fullest measure. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his great mercy has caused us to be born again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead, to obtain an inheritance which is imperishable and undefiled and will not fade away, reserved in heaven for you, who are protected by the power of God through faith for a salvation ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials, so that the proof of your faith, being more precious than gold, which is perishable, even though tested by fire, may be found to result in praise and glory and honor at the revelation of Jesus Christ. And though you have not seen him, you love him. And though you do not see him now, but believe in him, you greatly rejoice with joy inexpressible and full of glory obtaining as the outcome of your faith the salvation of your souls. Thus ends the reading of God's word. And our attention this morning will be focused on verse 6. In this you greatly rejoice, even though now for a little while, if necessary, you have been distressed by various trials. Now I am uh, reminded of the story of of the little Baptist lad whose friend down the road was a Roman Catholic, and he invited him to go to church with him, and uh, he finally relented and, and agreed to go to church with him, and, and the Roman Catholic never been in a Baptist church before, and so he, uh, he, was, he was just intrigued by everything that was so different from the Roman Catholic church and everything that would happen. He'd ask, what's, what's that mean, and, and, and what are they doing over there? And, and so uh, the, uh, the little boy whose dad happened to be the pastor uh, as the pastor stood up uh, to begin his sermon, he took out his uh, watch and set it on the pulpit, and the little Roman Catholic boy leaned over and said, what's that mean? And he says, that doesn't mean nothing. <laughs> and uh, I would just remind you that in, in the Presbyterian Church, we, uh, uh, we, we, we do take very seriously precedent. And I would just remind you that by my watch, Brother Todd timed out at one hour and seven minutes. And that is precedent. (laughs) My, uh, My dear brothers in ministry, we live in this moment as time bound creatures. I do not have time today to give a thorough exegetical treatment of our entire text. I do want to take a few moments. Uh, I want to make a few notations regarding the general context, and then I want to focus our concentration today on verse 6 under the title, Joy in Trial. Now, I've provided for you, and, and you should have in front of you, a teaching outline for these few verses in 1 Peter chapter 1. Uh, for the epistle as a whole, I have followed the the broad two-point outline given by Dr. Gordon Clark that 1 Peter is comprised of one, the doctrinal basis in chapter 1, verses 1 through 12, and two, the practical exhortations in chapter 1, verse 13 through chapter 5, verse 14, uh, that it is largely a practical, not a doctrinal book, but nonetheless with a doctrinal foundation. And so you have that outline before you. with highlighted the sections that we'll be looking at, uh, or in bold type, I should say, the sections that we'll be looking at this morning. Uh, sadly, time will not permit me to unpack this outline in any detail, but I, uh, I simply commit it to you as, uh, as a help to set our context 
within the cognitive, uh, to set this text within the cognitive context of these introductory verses in 1 Peter. And so you uh, find in bold print that part that we consider today, uh, 1B, 2A, joy in trial, uh, 1, joy to trial. And that part will fit under the first point of the real outline, which is at the bottom, uh, in which we have the exegesis of the text, secondly, uh, the Puritans and joy, and thirdly, and you. So, uh, though I can't go into a great deal of detail on the background of Peter, do let me mention just one important consideration of historical context in Peter's first epistle that bears poignantly on our consideration uh, this afternoon. And that's the date that Peter writes this. Peter's authorship and date is not nearly as disputed as are some other New Testament epistles. Uh, Within the pale of Orthodox reform scholarship, pretty much everyone acknowledges that it was written by Peter. Uh, It also acknowledges that uh, it was written to Jewish believers of the diaspora uh, and that it was written most likely uh, around 64 AD. And of course, you'll recognize the significance of that date, uh, 64 AD, as the year in which Rome burned. And that historic event, the burning of Rome, was used by the emperor as justification of his harsh persecutions of Christians in particular. And while those persecutions in the earliest days were confined pretty much to the region around Rome, uh, as time progressed, that persecution would indeed spread throughout the empire and would in time make its way to the doors of these Jewish believers of the diaspora, of the dispersion scattered throughout Asia Minor. As you read through Peter's epistle, it it is as though he is anticipating the coming of those fierce and fiery persecutions. That's not to minimize the persecutions they were already under from Jews, but there was more to come that we now know. Bearing that in mind, we notice that there are two themes woven throughout Peter's address. There is a major theme and a minor theme, somewhat like a musical composition. The major theme is that of joy, wherein you greatly rejoice in verse 6. Joy inexpressible, full of glory in verse 8. And the minor theme throughout his book is the theme of trials. And these two themes weave together in the score of the believer's sanctification, both of them necessary parts of our experience. In chapter 4, Peter will deal in more detail with their trials, but here he sets the stage, as it were, and gives two distinct thoughts of comfort to them in the midst of their trials that we'll see in just a moment. So the textual exegesis, A, joy and trial from verse 6, and one subpoint, joy. Now there's been some disagreement exegetically concerning what is the this in which you greatly rejoice. Some commentators have said that it is a reference to the phrase immediately preceding at the end of verse 5, in the last time. This would focus our joy in that blessed hope, that end time revelation of our Lord at his return. And along those lines, the Latin Vulgate translates it as future, in this you shall rejoice. And the Syriac also translates it that way, adding forever. But I believe the better understanding is that of Gill and Leighton and McLaren and Calvin and Henry, all of whom argue that it rather refers to the entire preceding sentence, reaching all the way back into verse 3. As Leighton says, it is better to see the antecedent in the whole complex sense of this preceding verse concerning the hope of glory. In this ye rejoice, that you're begotten again, that there is such an inheritance, and that you're made heirs of it, and that it is kept for you and you for it, that nothing can come betwixt you and it, and nothing can disappoint you of possessing and enjoying it, though there be many deserts and mountains and seas in the way. Yet you are ascertained that you will come safely hither. 
Now, Peter uses a very strong expression here when he says, you greatly rejoice. So the New American Standard, the NIV, and the King James Version give a better translation uh, than does the ESV or the RSV or the Geneva Bible, which simply say, you rejoice. While there is some ambiguity as to its form and some have translated as an imperative, I think Calvin and so many others rightly take it as an indicative, describing that you are rejoicing rather than commanding you to rejoice. Agaliaste is the middle present indicative, second person plural form of agalio, which could be translated as, as to exalt, to, to rejoice exceedingly, to delight. Uh, colloquial, colloquially today, we might say to, to leap for joy, to, uh, to, to jump for joy, or to burst with joy. It's an expressive term. You're not just cracking a smile. Uh, it's an expressive term. It indicates a deep-seated, a very deep and abiding joy. Second point is trial. Uh, yet in this verse, Peter leaves, us, Peter leaves us with a paradox. You know what a paradox is. Two doctors. Uh, I know there are different definitions of paradox. Uh, I'm not going, to, going there. But uh, uh, the defi definition that I'm using is a paradox is a seeming contradiction. There are two things that, that are juxtaposed together that kind of jar the brain. It's not, in fact, a real contradiction. God does not ask us to believe that A is not A in the same way at the same time. But at first blush, it certainly looks contradictory. Because in the same breath, he tells us that we're greatly rejoicing, and yet that we are at the same time distressed. A strong word, another strong word, by various trials. The passive aorist participle from uh, lupeo is accurately translated as distressed. It can also be translated as to be grieved, to be vexed, to be hurt, to be pained. And the plural perosmos can be translated as temptations, but it's more accurately translated here, I believe, as trials. John Calvin notices this seeming contradiction, and he says this. But it seems somewhat inco inconsistent when he says that the faithful who exulted with joy were at the same time sorrowful, for these are contrary feelings. But the faithful know by experience how these things can exist together much better than can be expressed in words. However, to explain the matter in a few words, we may say that the faithful are not logs of wood, nor have they so divested themselves of human feelings, but that they are affected with sorrow, they experience sorrow from evils, but it is so mitigated by faith that they cease not at the same time to rejoice. Though joy overcomes sorrow, yet it does not put an end to it, for it does not divest us of humanity. To which McLaren adds, they're to coexist. The joy is not to deprive the heaviness of its weight nor the sorrow of its sting. There is no artificial stoicism about Christianity, no attempt to sophisticate oneself out of believing in the reality of the evils that assail us, or to forbid that we shall feel their pain and their burden. We're not Christian scientists. That's me, not McLaren. McLaren says, many good people fail to get the good of life's discipline because they have somehow come to think that it is wrong to weep when Christ sends sorrow and wrong to feel, as other men feel, the grip and bite of the manifold trials of our earthly lives. Now, having said that, there are two specific points of comfort with regard to these trials that Peter emphasizes here in this verse. First is that they are temporary for a little while. He says, in the previous verse, he was focused on eternity. You see the contrast now for a little while. When you compare the time of our trials here with the idea of eternity, they really are temporary indeed. John Calvin pointed this out. He says, by saying, though now for a season or for a little while, 
He supplied consolation for the shortness of time, however hard evils may be, does not a little lessen them. And the duration of the the present life is but a moment of time. So they are temporary. And secondly, they are necessary. If necessary. These trials are not without purpose. They're not useless. They have their purpose in God's will for our lives. God does all things well. We know from Romans 8.28. What is one use of these trials? As we'll see in the next verse, they try our faith. Now Job 23.10, Psalm 66.10, make a comparison between being tried as gold, as Peter does in the next verse. It's worth the trouble. It's worth the heat. It's worth the discomfort because gold and silver are so precious. And so is your faith. It's an Old Testament imagery that would be quite familiar to these Jewish believers. God has his purpose in all of this trial, which we may not just see just yet. Another point of comfort in the language that Peter uses here, he says uh, he describes them as various trials. The word he uses for various or diverse is the Greek word poikilos which can be translated as many colored. Uh, It's the word that's used to describe the skin of a leopard uh, or a variegated leaf or a colorful embroidery. Uh, You've been distressed by many colored trials, he says. Now the only other place where Peter uses that word, poikilos, is in chapter four and verse 10, where he uses it to describe the grace of God. Oh yes. Your trials may be many colored at the moment, but also know that the grace of God is many colored as well. And for every facet of your multifaceted trials, there is also a facet to match in the multifaceted grace of God, facet for facet, stripe for stripe, spot for spot, color for color. And though these varied trials press us down, They cannot extinguish that great joy, that joy inexpressible that resides in our hearts by the work of the Holy Spirit. Now, there are two other points I want to make with regard to application to our particular circumstance here today. And the first might seem a little bit strange because I I would draw your attention. We're going to move forward in time from Peter's audience, yet still backward in time from us today. Uh, I would... uh, draw your attention to the today of roughly 350 years ago. And I do so because as you survey all of the history of dogma throughout the centuries, you look at the church's theological understanding of the biblical doctrine of joy in God. Yes, I said doctrine of joy in God. There is no other group of people in any other time period that had a more well-developed and theologically sound doctrine of joy in God particularly in the midst of trials, as our Puritan and Covenanter forefathers. And so I would just mention for a few moments the Puritans and joy. Quite a few people would be absolutely shocked to hear me make that assertion about, of all people, the gloomy Puritans. The picture I grew up with was similar to that described by the the historian that characterized Puritanism. He defined Puritanism as that haunting fear that someone, somewhere, might be happy. That quote, by the way, was from the German-American H.L. Mencken, who was a follower of Nietzsche, who despised religion and representative democracy, who was a fierce anti-Semite and favored the Nazis' social Darwinism. No one remembers his support for Hitler, but they all parrot his sad, mistaken definition of Puritanism. And the picture I grew up with in my, I confess, north of the Mason-Dixon, state-funded public education was quite in line with Mencken that the Puritans were an excessively gloomy lot, very like Winnie the Pooh's sad friend, Eeyore. Now, it doesn't take long, 
reading the literature of the Puritans, and I know so many of you know this, reading the literature of the Puritans themselves to find that they were certainly not a gloomy bunch. As Isaac Watts, uh, a a somewhat latter-day Puritan, wrote, the sorrows of the mind be banished from this place. Religion never was designed to make our pleasures less. Now, we must understand that the Puritan was, first of all, a worker in the world. He despised that monastic asceticism. What did the Puritan look like? Did he look like me and Johnny Cash, the men in black? Did he look like, as someone once asked my mentor, said, uh, did the Puritans look like the man on the Quaker oat box? <laughs> so, no, he's not a Puritan, he's a Quaker. That's why they're called Quaker oats. <laughs> Actually, the Puritan looked like many different people. They had great liberty in their manner of dress. In general, they dressed according to the English Renaissance style with either long hair or short hair equally acceptable. Cromwell's hair was long, his soldier's hair was short so they could get their little tin hats on. Uh, Antonella Wood, a royalist historian, describes the dress of the Prince of Puritans, John Owen. She says, normally he had knee-high soft Spanish leather boots with ribbons at the knee, lace at the cuffs uh, and neck, hat usually cocked, and enough powder on his hair to fire a cannon. (laughs) Of course, immodesty and ostentation were discouraged. That was in keeping with common good taste of the time. You would not find a Puritan in a leisure suit. I hope you still wouldn't today. Art and music were greatly enjoyed by the Puritans. People fail to realize it was under Puritan rule that opera was introduced into English society. Uh, Milton and Cromwell were great lovers of music, along with Bunyan and many other Puritans. Cromwell and others did not hesitate to adorn his garden with beautiful nude statues. Now, the Puritans recognized in the world uh, the presence of those who would today be described as that, that gloomy Puritanic type, those miserable sorts, you know. But they considered them as a psychologically unhealthy type in need of compassion and pastoral help. John Bunyan shows Greatheart and others persuading Mr. Feeble Mind to go on pilgrimage with them. Uh, There's a sharp contrast between the joyous, compassionate Puritan Greatheart and the sad, colorless, melancholic Mr. Feeble Mind who had to be carried even uphill difficulty. Read it for yourself. It's all there. Yes, unless history and literature can be completely ignored, the one thing the Puritans can never be charged with is the sin of joylessness. Yes, I said the sin of joylessness. Let me give you just a few quotes from the Puritans themselves that underscore that, and these could be multiplied many, many times. John Flavel on the Shorter Catechism says, "What what should be the main care of a Christian in this world? to maintain his joy in God to the last. Richard Sibbs, the sweetest of the Puritans, says, joy is that state of soul that all who have given their names to Christ either are in or should be in. Nathaniel Ward bought a house in Ipswich near the east coast of England before he came over here across the pond. The previous owner of his house had carved into the mantle what he had considered the three prime virtues, sobriety, he obviously wasn't a Presbyterian, justice, it's a joke, (laughs) and piety. And Nathaniel Ward immediately called for the woodcarver to add a fourth word, laughter. Nathaniel Ward said, I have two great comforts to live on, one in the perfections of Christ, and the other is in the imperfections of all Christians. Richard Baxter wrote his 10 words to the joyless man. He expounds at length why one should have joy in the Lord and what damage joylessness will do. He says, among other things, the lack of delight in God and holiness is the way to apostasy itself. Few men will hold on in a way they have no delight in when all other delights must be forsaken for it. William Guthrie, 
the Covenanter, cousin to that great martyr James Guthrie, author of uh, The Christian's Great Interest. Phenomenal book. John Owen said, I'd trade all of the books I've written to have been able to write that one book, The Christian's Great Interest. Uh, William Guthrie was known for his laughter. Uh, sometimes he was rebuked for it, uh, like on the floor of the assembly at Westminster. Sometimes it, it, it's not considered appropriate. He was known for his laughter. He was known for, uh, uh, for his joy. And, and for him, laughter and prayer were just as natural to go hand in hand. He was visited once by the Scot, uh, you know, the, the Scot, uh, John Durham, uh, and they, uh, they had, a, had a wonderful time together, laughing together and, and enjoying the evening. And, uh, and then uh, uh, they went into prayer. And as the historian writes, it was as though heaven came down. And after that prayer, John Durham turned to William Guthrie and said, Willie, had I been half as daft as thou hast been this day, I would not have been able to pray like that for a fortnight. But, but that's the way. It, there was no contradiction. They go hand in hand. There's no, uh, it's all a part of the true Christian life when you understand the doctrine of joy in the Lord. Uh, he was a great deer hunter. He was a salmon fisherman. Now, in terms of the natural bent of his personality, you might not know that William Guthrie was a melancholic, prone to depression. But his doctrine of joy in God was so clear and so forceful and applied by the Holy Spirit that his natural tendency to depression was kept well in check and well under control. Just read, by, just read uh, uh, L'Allegro by uh, the Puritan poet John Milton, who was blind, remember, and might have had reason to be gloomy, as he talks of, and I'm going to read the whole thing to you. Go ahead and read it. It's wonderful. As he talks of laughter holding both his sides, of jest and youthful jollity, unreproved pleasures free, these delights if thou canst give mirth with thee, I mean to live. One other matter regarding the Puritans and joy in God, just a running acquaintance with their book titles should be sufficient to show that they were not gloomy or dismal. Richard Alistair writes The Art of Contentment. Alexander Gross writes, and I love this title, The Happiness of Enjoying. The happiness of, in, the full title, The Happiness of Enjoying and Making a True and Speedy Use of the Lord Jesus. Jeremiah Burroughs writes, The Rare Jewel of Christian Contentment, one of those gems that everyone should have in their library. He also writes, The, the Saints' Happiness, together with the several steps leading thereunto. Joseph Carroll writes, Joy Outjoyed, on Luke 10:20. Robert Bolton writes true happiness, and we could go on and on and on. How about John Bunyan, greatest literary genius of all time, bar none, and Puritan of the Puritans, fellow who spent so many years in a gloomy prison and wrote his greatest work from that gloomy prison. Do you realize there are no less than 27 songs in Pilgrim's Progress? One of the criticisms made uh, by a man who tried to rewrite Pilgrim's Progress was, he laughs too much. At the cross, Pilgrim gives three leaps for joy. He's always singing or finding a trumpet to blow or a bell to ring, dancing, laughing for joy. And the poor fellow who said that Pilgrim laughs too much, he did rewrite it. Uh, poor guy, nobody'd buy it. <laughs> uh, Bunyan understood the joy of the Lord, the doctrine of the joy of the Lord. Take the Trinity hymnal sometime, the old Trinity. Uh, just look at some of the hymns written by the Puritans. Number 17 by Richard Baxter, Away distrustful care, I have thy promise, Lord. To banish all despair, I have thine oath and word. 135 by John Calvin, I greet thee who my sure redeemer art. 127 by Newton, let us love and sing and wonder. What about John Milton, number 30? Let us with a gladsome mind praise the Lord, for he is kind. Those poor, gloomy Puritans. No, the Puritans were not gloomy melancholics. Rather, they were, they were the ones who fully developed the doctrine of joy in God. 
Now remember how fiercely persecuted they were in their time. Imprisoned, fined astronomical sums, pilloried, tortured, having their ears and their noses slit by the star chamber in the court of high commission, ejected from the church, had their degrees removed, burned at the stake, drowned, beheaded, sent into real poverty, many of the ministers particularly. They, more than anyone, would have reason to say, woe is me. But it was they, more than any, who had an understanding of what joy is really about. They could laugh, they could dance, they could play and sing. They truly knew how to be merry. But for them, it was important that such joy comes from a heart that is pure before God. Someone shorter than this answer this question. What is the chief end of man? There are people here shorter than this, I know. What is the chief end of man? Shorter than this. <laughs> Do I hear it? What, what, did I, what, what was it? Your chief end. This is much better than the little boy who was asked that question, the chief end of man, and, said, and answered, it's his head, I think. <laughs> his chief end, his primary purpose, his, the reason that he's here, yes, is to glorify God and to enjoy him forever. You know, it's strange that we who live in this culture which has made an inalienable right out of the pursuit of happiness, that spends untold energies and fortunes looking for and chasing after that ever so elusive pleasure, that even in its Christianity seeks with all of its might to be happy, happy, happy all the time, 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 that we in this culture should be such strangers to what really is the joy of the Lord. That that true joy should be so foreign to us. Third point, and you. Brothers, you don't need a special revelatory prophetic gift to be able to tell that darker days appear to be coming in this country. Just hearken back to what Reed was saying yesterday, to what Ken was saying yesterday. Brothers, I weep for this country. Many are the enemies of the gospel. But we're seeing a few giants in the enemy's service growing in strength. The militantly and violently false religion of Islam is very recently growing far more bold and hateful in its persecution of believers around the world. And they've brought that to our shores. Christians are dying as martyrs in the Middle East, being driven from their homes in record numbers. For some reason, Christian refugees are not welcome here in this country. But Muslim refugees are being brought here in great numbers. Muslim influence is growing here at a breakneck pace. And you and I know that their end goal is not and never was peaceful coexistence and toleration. Their end goal is the end of Christianity and the world dominion of Islam. And yet, what strange bedfellows. Another giant that draws up in battle array against the gospel in Christ's church is that really relatively small portion of our culture 
that is proudly known for its sexual deviancy. From the amount of noise they make, you'd think that half the country's population fit into the apostles' description in Romans 1. Well, I know they all do in, in, in one respect, but there's one particular respect I'm talking about. I think you know what I mean. But though their actual number may be small, they've made themselves into a formidable giant with a growing stranglehold on our culture's legal and political system and, of course, the entertainment industry. And my friends, you would be incredibly naive if you believed that their end goal is simply the right to marry. Their end goal is nothing short of the criminalization of Christianity, biblical Christianity, and then the extinction of biblical Christianity. We, brothers, we belong behind bars, and worse, in their estimation. So who can with any degree of surety give an, uh, give an assurance that none of us will find ourselves in their crosshairs in coming years? I pray that Ken's right and we're the last ones. Actually, I pray that Randy's right and God sends a great awakening. But can you be so certain that because we are small, because our churches are small, because we are articulate, because our spheres of influence are comparatively insignificant, that we will not be targeted by their attacks? Who in this room, within the next 15 years, might find themselves falling under the direct ministrations of Reverend Glau's work within the prison system? And here I would simply remind you, brothers, of your history and what remarkable persecutions were faced by our Puritan and covenanting forefathers in a historically Christian country because they were men of conscience. Imprisonment, fines, tortures, and worse, because they refused to call evil good and good evil. And I would simply suggest that the days when we may be joining them are perhaps closer than you might think. And with that reality hanging over your head, I would, simply, I would simply encourage you that no matter what terrors may be thrown at you by the enemy, that you take heart and take to heart that lesson of the Puritans and resist the urge to respond in bitterness. Now, brothers, I'm preaching to myself here. I, I, I struggle to keep in proper perspective that practical application in my own life of the biblical doctrine of joy in God. When the battle's thick and, and, and the attacks are coming, my first inclination is not to rejoice, like the apostles in the book of Acts. I was talking to Randy uh, a little while ago, and I mentioned how I'd, how, I'd mention, how I'd run across this picture of a of a young lad. He was a teenager, what, 13 years old, I think, um, in one of the African countries where Boko Haram, I believe, uh, I'm, I, I think I'm remembering this right. Forgive me if I'm not. I believe it was Boko Haram is uh, active, and they took him and they macheted him. Uh, they they hacked his arm nearly off, or maybe it hacked it completely off, uh, hacked his face. And I remember seeing a picture of this, this fellow uh, with his face disfigured from the machete uh, uh, slices all over his face, his arm uh, bandaged, unable to use. Uh, uh, but what struck me, what leaped out at me from that picture of this little fellow was his smile in his eyes, in his mouth. And, and he talked not of bitterness. He talked not of revenge. He talked of joy in what God had given him. That's what I want to see in my eyes, in my face, in my heart. And that's what I struggle with, brothers.
that, brothers, the enemy may take away your goods. He may take away your freedom. He may take away your rights. All things considered, compare us here in this room today with the believers in Iraq, with the believers in Syria. And when we do that, let's pray for them, brothers. The enemy may take away all of these things as he has over there, but by God's holy mercies, never let him take away your joy. What can these anxious cares avail thee, these never ceasing moans and sighs? What can it help if thou bewail thee, or each dark moment as it flies? Our cross and trials do but press the heavier for our bitterness. Only be still and wait his leisure in cheerful hope with heart content to take whate'er thy father's pleasure and all discerning love hath sent. Nor doubt in our inmost wants are known to him who chose us for his own. Sing, pray, and keep his ways unswerving. So do thine own part faithfully and trust his word, though undeserving. Thou yet shall find it true for thee. God never yet forsook at need the soul that trusted him indeed. It will be a little bit unusual here, brothers. I know we normally end in a prayer, and we don't often end in a benediction. Benediction doesn't have to be at the end, I believe. Um, but a benediction is simply bene, good, diction, words, good word, a good word, a pronouncement of a covenant good word from God. And so I would ask you to rise. And receive now from him this good word. Now to him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you blameless before the presence of his glory with great joy. To the only God, our Savior, through Jesus Christ our Lord, be glory, majesty, dominion, and authority before all time and now and forever. Amen.